Good evening, fellow workers, and welcome to another Rutgers Learn production. We still can't eat prestige. Lessons from arts and culture organizing. Moderated by Sarah Jaffe and featuring worker leaders from several cultural institutions across the US. My name is Todd Vishan, and I'm the director of the Labor Education Action Research Network, or simply LEARN, at Rutgers University. LEARN is the Educational Extension Division of the Department of Labor Studies and Employment Relations, and we sponsor public programs, classes, and activities that disseminate knowledge, skills, and ideas that strengthen the community at work, facilitate its organization on a more democratic basis, and address unjustified inequalities of power and wealth in the wider society. I would like to invite you to please like and follow us on your preferred social media platform to stay up to date with all of our offerings, including open enrollment classes, custom trainings, and public programs like tonight's webinar. And now to kick us off for tonight's program, I'm delighted to introduce my friends and colleagues Rebecca Collins Given, Professor of Labor Studies and Employment Relations at Rutgers University, and Andrew Urban, Professor of American Studies and History, also at Rutgers University. Becky and Andy, take it away. Thank you, Todd. I want to thank uh, Learn for uh, putting on uh, this great panel. I'm really excited to hear from museum workers who are organizing right now, uh, and uh, it's exciting to, to have this group together. Um, I'll just say if you could, if you want to introduce yourselves in the chat, make sure you select everyone and everyone can see uh, who you are and uh, let's go ahead and do that so we can uh, get to know who's here. Um, when we say we still can't eat prestige for those of us that have been thinking about labor and work for a long time, we can't eat prestige is um, something we've said for a long time going back to the clerical workers organizing at Harvard and Yale. Um, who were paid a sub-living wage because um, they should be grateful and mission aligned and other such things. And um, here we are in a moment where uh, some of the most prestigious, wealthiest museums um, in the world um, are uh, not treating their workers with respect or not honoring their uh, commitments, their stated commitments to equity, diversity, and inclusion, and are uh, expecting many of their workers to be grateful and to feel uh, happy about the prestige and status. So um, I'm going to let Andy say a few things about where we are. Andy Urban is a historian who really thinks about public history and the material circumstances of public history. So uh, he and I uh, have kind of put our heads together for this. I'll let Andy say a few remarks and then I'll um, introduce our moderator. Thanks, Megan. And can everybody hear me okay? Great. Um, well, again, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Andy Urban. And uh, as Todd mentioned, I'm an associate professor in American studies and history at uh, Rutgers, New Brunswick, and I'm vice president of the New Brunswick chapter of our AUP AFT union. Uh, and in addition, uh, as Becky mentioned, to conducting research in the fields of migration and labor history, I'm also a scholar, teacher, and practitioner of the public humanities. Uh, and this evening, I'll tether my introductory remarks to what I'll call here an aspirational question. What can it mean for museum workers to have more say over the means and ends of production in the specific context of museum labor? Union battles for better wages, health and safety perfection, uh, protections and benefits are of course of crucial importance and I'm not trying to deny or downplay that at all. But I also believe that unions representing museum workers should devote focus and resources to trying to win greater control over the services and goods that museums produce as cultural institutions and how as political, economic and social actors, museums function. Um, and I say this, I'm a former employee of the Lower East Side Tenement Museum. I worked there uh, from 2001 to 2005. Um, and recently I had a chance to uh, conduct some interviews with former workers at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum who were cruelly laid off in July 2020, just as their bargaining unit was beginning uh, to negotiate what would have been their first contract. Um, and I discovered in the course of doing these interviews that uh, union, uh, union members at the Tenement Museum were really adamant that their collective action could force the museum to contend with its poor record of hiring, 
and promoting educators of color. Uh, they believed that the union could finally compel museum management to recognize and grant formal powers to the People of Color Caucus, a worker-founded and led initiative that had been uh, long marginalized by management. Uh, union members had also begun asking questions about how the museum was being run on a more structural level by management and, and whether man management was really being faithful um, in any form or fashion to the museum's stated mission. Um, for instance, the Tenement Museum's Board of Trustees to this day contains numerous finance executives and real estate developers. Uh, even though the museum has long claimed that its primary stakeholders and the people and audiences um, that it really wants to serve first and foremost are working class immigrants in New York City. Uh, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, educators at the Tenement Museum wanted credit. Um, and I don't just mean credit and again, the kind of sense of better pay, although certainly they probably would have welcomed that as well. Um, but they wanted credit for the fact that on the interactive tours of the museum's historic tenements that they led, um, as workers, they were responsible for responding to difficult questions about race, class, and exclusionary immigration policies, and really for ensuring that visitors walked away informed. And as so many of you work in museums, you know how this goes. Management seemed to be constantly forgetting that it was frontline workers' knowledge production that created such a meaningful experience to begin with and brought visitors and their dollars through the door. And I'll end my intro remarks here, but I, I just wanted to frame our conversation tonight in these terms and really encourage us all to think about how unions and museums might embrace this broader vision of what they might help achieve. Um, I really you know, think that improved working conditions is crucial, um, but museums workers, museum workers, as you all know, have so much more to offer. Uh, so thanks for inviting me to give these introductory remarks and I'm, I'm super excited to hear what all of our panelists have to say. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, I want to introduce our moderator. Um, I know people like to have, or whether they like it or not, often have uh, cheesy introductions to moderators. But when Todd, Andy, and I talked about this, the only person we wanted to moderate this was the person who told us that work won't love you back. That seems the most appropriate way to think about what we're talking about tonight. So um, Sarah Jaffe is probably familiar to many of you, as well as um, being the author of of uh, many amazing and timely articles and two books, the most recent uh, being Work Won't Love You Back, How Devotion to Our Jobs Keeps Us Exploited, Exhausted, and Alone. Uh, Sarah is also a Type Media Center reporting fellow and also co-hosts uh, Descent Magazine's Belabored podcast, which I highly recommend. Um, and Sarah is someone who has an amazing ability to draw uh, out conversations, to write about uh, some of the most timely issues for work and working people. And um, she's been a labor reporter uh, since long before, as we like to say, everybody became a labor reporter. So we're thrilled that Sarah agreed to um, moderate our panel and I will pass things over to, over to Sarah and uh, we will hear from our wonderful panelists. So thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for the lovely, not at all cheesy introduction. Um, it really is a pleasure to be here. I have been watching with great interest the organizing of art museum workers. During the pandemic, I spoke with a few art museum workers, including someone from the Guggenheim Union who said to me, you know, after we get out of this, we're gonna want, we're gonna need the arts in order to feel like humans again. And I think about that probably every day. Um, so I'm not gonna talk too much. I just wanted to say sort of in the beginning that I hung half of the argument of work won't love you back on the narratives around art as work or more accurately, the narrative that we get that art isn't work, that it is something that we do because we love it, that we care about it, that, you know, the starving artist and, and uh, will like cut off their own ear and blah, 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 as long as they get to continue to make art. And what that does, not only to the art, the artist who is creating their art that is going to be displayed in the museum, but all of the other people involved in the creation, the production, the display, the creation of the prestige around the art. 
Um, so I'm really excited to be here and I'm just gonna quickly introduce our panelists and then let them tell you about themselves and their work. Um, so first we're gonna hear from Robert Bernier, who is a 15 year veteran of the Art Institute of Chicago, working as a specialist for painting and sculpture of Europe, which is one of its largest departments. He is also, as many art museum workers are, I believe, an artist, writer, and educator, holding a master's in painting from the School of the Art Institute. And he is a member of the organizing committee for AICWU, the Art Institute of Chicago Workers United. Next, we'll hear from Maro Elliott, who has over a decade of experience working in the fields of arts and culture. She's currently the manager of institutional giving at Mass MoCA, where she is also a member of the Mass MoCA Union, Local 2110 UAW, Organizing and Negotiating Committees. Maro received her BA from Smith College and studied in the NYU Tisch Performance Studies MA program. Then we have Carissa Francis, who is an organizer and arts worker based in New York. She's worked at the Whitney Museum since November 2016, and in July 2021, she helped form the Whitney Museum Union, and she was recently elected to the bargaining committee for the Whitney Museum Union. And last but not least, Brian Caputo works for the IT department for the Philadelphia Museum of Art and is a trustee for the Philadelphia Museum of Art Union, though he notes they have no contract yet. He's also a shop steward and he's been involved in the union drive since before they went public. And he wanted to note that his past experience with unions includes volunteering with Philadelphia Jobs with Justice when they were working on getting security guards unionized across different institutions across Philadelphia, including at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, which I just wanted to say is one of the very first labor stories I ever wrote for the Nation magazine back in 2009. So here we are full circle, sort of. Um, and on that note, I'm gonna hand it over to Robert to tell us a little bit about um, his organizing story. Sure, thank you, Sarah. Um, well, you know, I the organizing has been going on for quite some time. And as you all know, it has started small and quiet. And uh, so I was, my personal experience was somewhat later in the process when some of the folks from AFSCME and some of the folks from the museum in different turns um, came to me and, and told me about what was happening. Um, I thought about it a little but not, I hope too much because really it was to me having been there as long as I have been there was something that I felt in a way I was surprised it hadn't already happened, you know. Um, but in another way I'm not, because as you all have related, um, these institutions have an interesting dual existence with art and the human experience, the progressive values that it projects and a somewhat, shall we say, static way of, of organizing itself internally um, that I think could use some change. So um, the organizing effort has been vigorous, it's been strong, it has been exciting. Um, I've, I've met so many great people who, you know, I've, I've known great people from working there, but I've been introduced to so many more creative and intelligent folks who, who care a lot about the museum, want it to be better for its own sake. Because I think, you know, as someone earlier had said, Yes, wages and benefits, stagnant, sometimes going backwards. And those things are in sore need of being addressed. But as an institution, I think I feel that it works better when the workers have a voice because time and time again, when there's been a knot to untie, I believe that including people in the process gets you there faster. I think it's actually a benefit the museum and management to hear from workers um, who do things every day and who know the ins and outs. Um, that dialogue is what we're looking for. Right now, um, our drive is strong. We have a majority and we're looking for super majority. We're getting there soon, I, I believe, very strongly. And uh, we're going in this with a lot of energy. Um, and I guess there's probably more I could tell you about all that. I'm excited to, but maybe I'll wait for for some other people to introduce their, their stories. Thanks, Robert. Um, Maro, you ready to jump in? Yes. 
Hi, everyone. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm uh, the manager of institutional giving at Mass Milka, um, and I've been working there since January 2018. Um, and I'd like to first thank my fellow panelists for being here and for sharing their experiences um, to Andy, Becky, Todd, and everyone at Rutgers Learn for organizing the panel and uh, to Sarah for moderating. And um, I also wanna thank uh, all of my fellow Mass Mocha union members and Maida Rosenstein, Chelsea Farrell, and Frankie Altamara at UAW Local 2110 uh, for all of the work that they've been doing to help us organize. Um, I'll start by giving just a bit of background on Mass MoCA. Um, Mass MoCA stands for the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, we're located in North Adams, Massachusetts in Northern Berkshire County, right on the Vermont border. And we opened to the public in 1999 and are well known for presenting uh, large scale works of both visual and performing arts. Um, and so about our organizing efforts, I'll say that uh, although the pandemic catalyzed them. Um, for years, there had been conversations at the museum among small groups of uh, staff members about our working conditions and how we would like to improve them, um, but these groups weren't necessarily in conversation uh, with one another. So in uh, the year uh, or so before the pandemic, um, there was talk of unionizing, um, and many of us were aware of the organizing efforts that were taking place at other museums. Um, but we were too uh, afraid of retaliation really to move the idea forward. Um, so then at the beginning of the pandemic um, in March, 2020, Mass MoCA laid off um, 120 staff members, um, which was about 70% of our staff. Um, and I'll also say that I, um, however, along with the rest of the uh, development and fundraising department uh, was not laid off. Um, so, while that was happening, uh, it became very clear how little job protection we all had, um, you know, despite everyone there being hardworking, skilled, dedicated, um, and even staff members with very long tenures at the museums were seemingly just simply let go. Um, and so these layoffs all created um, a, a real feeling of mistrust um, at the museum um, among uh, former and current staff members. Uh, so within a few months uh, of the layoffs, MassMoCA rehired many, uh, but not all of uh, the laid off staff. And once staff returned um, with little acknowledgement from management about what had happened, um, we all felt that that was the moment for us to really get serious about collective action. And so uh, after speaking with organizers at other museums and doing some research, we contacted uh, UAW Local 2110. And we decided to organize with uh, 2110 because um, as part of the United Auto Workers, they're one of the most powerful unions in the country and represent thousands of technical office and professional workers um, at many museums, including MoMA, the New Museum, the MFA Boston, uh, PMA Maine, and the Whitney, um, the Guggenheim, uh, who uh, just won their election today. So congratulations uh, to them. Um, so after um, identifying Local 2110 um, at Mass Boca, we formed our organizing committee and began the process of you know, methodically reaching out to and speaking with our coworkers to learn about their concerns. Uh, which include job security, greater transparency and accountability, increased wages, improved benefits, and opportunities for professional development and growth within Mass MoCA. And we also talked, of course, about what we love about Mass MoCA um, and all of the work that we would like to preserve there. Um, we announced our intention to unionize in March 2021. Um, and during that process, management remained neutral um, and was, was very cooperative, uh, which we all really appreciated. And um, we ultimately won our election at the end of April. And our organizing efforts um, have come at an exciting uh, transitional moment for the museum. Uh, Mass MoCA's founding director just stepped down last October and um, just at the end of last month, we announced a new executive director. 
and we acknowledged uh, the particular circumstances of our organizing efforts um, in our union mission statement um, by saying, at this pivotal moment of changeover in Masnoka's highest level of leadership, um, it is crucial to set the tone in caring for our workforce. And I'm excited to say that now um, we recently began the process of negotiating our first contract. So that's where, yeah, where we are in our organizing process. All right, excellent, thank you. Um, and now, Carissa, you wanna tell us about the Whitney. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. It's so wonderful um, to be on this panel and to be able to talk about and also learn more about different organizing efforts. Um, so I work in front of house at the Whitney. I've always kind of been um, a customer service oriented type of person. I really like people and engaging with people. And the Whitney is actually my first um, arts job. Actually, yeah, well, technically second, but my first like long-term real arts job, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, we started um, talking about organizing last September and the way it's just kind of snowballed and progressed from there has been really amazing and cool. I had no doubts about that though. So I'll just go ahead and out myself. I was the person who <laughs> reached out to local 2110 um, and was just like, hey, like we need a union. <laughs> um, and I feel like I kind of, um, I don't wanna say bullied, but really strongly encouraged everyone else to get on board. I'm um, sorry, that's my cat. <laughs> he loves to be on Zoom. Um, so yeah, I kind of um, was inspired actually by the efforts at the new museum, which I felt was a very comparable kind of institution to the Whitney. And I felt like it was just a time when a lot of places were talking about unionizing and just like workers were kind of being more open about what was going on, um, you know, with the pandemic, with layoffs. Um, I would say what really kind of set me off <laughs> to kind of really um, wanting to pursue organizing and talking to my colleagues about things is the fact that, um, many workers who were on site for the entirety of the pandemic were not receiving any sort of um, uh, pay, sort of um, hazard pay, that's the word. Um, that, and then also the layoffs, which we also, many institutions also experienced, um, you know, it was just, <laughs> it was time. Um, similar um, to Mass Local, we also kind of had like these pockets of people talking about things like better work conditions, better pay, um, extending things like healthcare. So, you know, I feel like that coupled with my wonderful colleagues at the Whitney, it just felt like, you know, um, an opportune time to start to, you know, really have these serious conversations and do something about them. Um, yeah, we often joke at the Whitney too that like, <laughs> Oh, you know, one of our favorite things to do with each other is complain. Um, so it feels good to kind of put those complaints into like direct action and actually like, you know, discussing how we can move forward in a more, <laughs> so sorry, in a more um, productive way. Um, yeah, so it's really exciting seeing all the organizing that's been going on throughout the city and different institutions as well. Um, with the Whitney particularly, I feel like there's something really special about the Whitney where everyone really actually likes each other <laughs> and cares about each other. Um, so it kind of like wasn't all that hard to get people on board and to get people interested. Like a lot of Whitney employees really care and a lot of arts employees in general really care about the mission and what goes on in that building and always wants to like work toward innovation and improvement, so. It's been a really interesting and cool experience um, organizing and just talking to people and learning more about, you know, different aspects of museum work and how the day to day affects us. And, you know, I think the pandemic was definitely a big wake up call for a lot of people. Um, and it definitely uh, highlighted the fact that like none of us are kind of safe. Um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Carissa and Kitty. Um, okay, and finally, Brian, oh, take us away. Quick IT trip, uh, tip. tip. 
Uh, if you get a fake laptop for your cat, they will want to mimic you and hang on the fake laptop too. So, um, the, yeah, that's what I've seen on Instagram and some uh, TikTok videos. You know, the, 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 like someone was like, "It works." Um, anyways, uh, so hi, I'm Brian from the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, so, uh, where do I start? Uh, I mean, you guys have pretty much encapsulated and said everything that goes on in almost every single museum. It seems like, you know, um, work is not being heard, uh, you know, no rights or, or credit for the frontline workers who have that institutional knowledge and, you know, are, to, are talking to the guests and giving them the experience that um, museums want to give their guests, you know, that they, they tend to forget that sometimes. So, we started uh, organizing, um, I guess there were rumblings early, early on 2019, 2018. Uh, there were a couple scandals that happened at our, our museum. Um, there were like New York Times articles about it, about uh, some abusive things that had happened. And, um, and it seemed like the institution wasn't or didn't do anything during those periods to Held those abuse of scandals. So a lot of talk started happening. Um, there was that whole museum wage uh, spreadsheet that spread around. Uh, one of our curators um, helped start that with uh, some other curators, I think at the Boston Museum of Art. Um, and so that spreadsheet also um, spread out and showed the huge discrepancies that people with, you know, five, six years degrees were making uh, under a living wage or even, you know, they were making poverty wages in a sense, you know, they were dedicated, they were sacrificing their life for the museums and the institution. Um, and so there was all that combination and our uh, people in our education department uh, who reached out to me, um, those were the biggest drivers, I think, uh, the, the first organizers, I would say, because those were the ones that always uh, would, I heard secret messages, I guess, you know, the, 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 the gossip um, that happened, uh, you know, oh, are you interested in union? What do you think about this? You know, a little coffee talk at, at the, the shop around the corner. Um, so it was like a huge grassroots movement. So when I finally got involved, like, I want to say it was two or three months. I can't, I don't even know the exact date. It was quite a few times. Um, it was it was nice to see that they already had, you know, a union that they wanted to go with, you know, um, a local, uh, and and I was like really surprised how far that they had gotten without actually even like reaching out to to any any uh, major um, unions. Uh, so I was and I was like shocked because doing that work is usually unions sometimes uh, come in and, and engage situations before they. And, and like, you know, when I did the unionization with the Allied Barton, we would, we were like jumping. I don't know who reached out to them, but I know we were always hounding the guards, I guess, you know, um, about unionization versus us. It wasn't, you know, the outside union wasn't involved. It was all internal and grassroots and uh, the staff who were having these conversations, chasing everyone down. Um, so then we were getting ready to go public and uh, the pandemic hit and we were all shocked, you know, um, efforts stopped in a sense, you know, they were on pause uh, because, you know, there were uh, some layoffs and, and, and um, furloughs and pay cuts. Uh, the museum says it tried its best to keep everyone employed at the time you know uh, some people took bigger pay cuts than other people uh but there were still ultimately layoffs and some people didn't work or get paid during the time of the early stages of the pandemic um and so i think that helped galvanize even more people uh into getting a super majority and during that time we uh did mail-in ballots we had the, the nlrb was just like you can do a mail-in ballot because we this was like at the very beginning and um we got a super majority and we won. We knew we were going to win. We knew we knew how people were going to vote in a sense, you know, because we were them. <laughs> um, we were those people. We we talked to them every single day, um, and 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 pushed our drive. Uh, now we've been in negotiations for a while. Um, 
they're grueling. Uh, I don't sit in all the meetings because they're 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 long, uh, and after the end of the day, you, you know, sometimes you don't want to go on another three hours or four hours uh, sitting in meetings. Um, but the negotiation committee is is the bargaining committee. They're they're pulling, you know, they're 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 pulling out all the stops, and they're 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 working hard for us. Um, and and um, sorry. <laughs> uh, well, I lost for words right now. At, at, I'm at in awe at the work that they do, because um, it's a lot of contracts to go over. It's a lot of um, weeding through uh, through um, current policies in the museum and and seeing how we can either improve those with contract negotiations and time off pay and and whatnot. Right now, we're our strategy is to focus on more tentative agreements versus um, uh, economic uh, agreements because this it, you know they're they're screaming about not screaming about but everybody talks about how institutions have no money so let's focus on something that is not monetary right now and, and then get on the monetary pages to to move things along um, but you know it's, it's going to be a tough fight uh, you know, but everybody is coming to the table, um, and you know, and and management has been so far showing up and and not, you know, not like dragging its feet as as some institutions may do. Uh, but so, yeah. And good luck with everybody who's about to start bargaining, and uh, <laughs> so, um, you know. Uh, have some drinks afterwards if you drink. <laughs> so, and uh, have lots of union picnics. Uh, you know, you can at the, at the time. Like seeing people face to face after the pandemic is also good. Having that camaraderie and knowing why you're doing this. Um, sometimes, you know, like I work IT, so I see everybody in the museum all the time. You know, how many times are you guys calling IT for something? <laughs> you know, so we, you, you guys know all your IT people. So, you know, we know you guys um but there are other departments that you guys don't quite interact with every day or or hardly so the unionization efforts helps you know bring everybody together and, and you get to see the big picture and, and big team and you know um winning wall to wall was a nice thing too because you get to include everybody mm -hmm. um so and that, that was one of our biggest things too was to not leave anybody out you know um and and uh trying to fight for your 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 bargaining unit i guess it, it was one of the hard things too seeing who's in the who's eligible who's not eligible and arguing with management who's who's a manager who's not just because they have a manager title doesn't necessarily mean they manage people or you know so that there's always there was always that fighting back and forth but so <laughs> good luck and uh, um, and I, best of all, and I know you guys, uh, you guys are dedicated. And, you know, you guys have gotten this far, so I know you guys will get even further. So, excellent. Thanks, Brian. Um, so I am going to ask a few questions of our panel now, but I want to encourage everybody to put questions or comments um, in the chat. But also, if you have questions that you specifically want me to ask the panelists, please put them in the Q&A button down the bottom here. I will be keeping an eye on that. Um, but to start off with um, moderator's privilege, I wanted to ask you all to reflect a little bit more on this labor of love narrative that gets deployed, maybe particularly during a union drive and during bargaining that uh, the expectations of what you will do because you love your job. Um, has that come up for anybody? Um, is that something you've heard from the boss? Is that something you've heard from maybe your coworkers who don't wanna push that hard or don't wanna get involved in the struggle? How has that sort of come up for people? Um, I don't know if any of you specifically wanna to speak to that. I see Maro nodding, so I'm going to call on you. <laughs> sure. Um, yes, certainly the um, the idea of uh, us of of art workers being willing to work for low wages and under difficult circumstances be out of a love for the work and a dedication and a passion for it 
um, has certainly come up and is present I, in all uh, organizing efforts. Um, and also uh, the idea of you know, your coworkers or the museum being a family too, I think ties, ties into the, the love, um, but it's, it's not uh, a family. The dynamics are very different. Um, and it's, uh, although we're certainly very close and are of course, uh, supportive of one another and are uh, and 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 do have a lot of you know, love and affection for each other. But um, yes, it it can be used. Um, that kind of language um, can be really uh, yeah used used uh, against uh, workers too. Uh, do I just jump in? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, they hardly need to say it during this because they say it all the time. And it's because there's a, some truth to it, right? I mean, it is a wonderful thing to be doing and it's a great place. And none of us are talking about how that's not true. That's absolutely true. Um, you know, the passion and the love that goes into that, you know, the question for me is, do we have a passion in return? What kind of passion do we get from those who are the luminaries that are responsible for this? Who in a way are, you know, they can buy <laughs> uh, this sort of recognition, um, but we need to pay rent, you know? So for us, it's like, we can't purchase that. And that prestige doesn't, isn't accepted at Starbucks. So it's like, you know, the, the equal passion to take care of those who have the passion for the art. Um, and that's not necessarily always pay, you know. I think that's a component of recognizing people. And even in the private sector, which I have worked in quite extensively in my life, I've worked in the private sector as well. Passion was required there too, there's no question about it. You know, they want you to be up at night. They want you to be worried about the job. They want you to be doing the things that they hired you to do and that they're paying you for. And usually connected to that is some sort of remuneration to say, we recognize your effort and here it is. Now, it isn't the same kind of growth model in a museum as it is in a private industry necessarily, but at least at the Art Institute, I can't speak for other places. I don't feel like it's exactly destitute. So, um, you know, we've got a little bit of a disconnect with that messaging and what I think the museum is capable of. Um, but again, going back to, you know, not necessarily pay as a way of recognizing and putting teeth to, or feet to the prestige is just, you know, a voice for the workers. And I, this sounds pat, but it really is very important. It's, I'm not saying this as a slogan. It, it really matters that the people who put the passion and, and the, the focus on this institution are heard about their opinion about how the work is handled how we do our jobs. And I say it over and over to people, it's, it's better for management. <laughs> Their job right now is hard in a way because not bringing us into that conversation has caused a lot of strife that may not have been necessary, you know? So, um, and in my own personal experience, I know that time and again, we've had chances to talk about stuff and we've worked them out. So. The pandemic has made all of that much harder because people are further apart. And, you know, I think it's taking us a while even to adjust to being together again on that sense of communicating and trying to see what this other person is really saying to us. So, you know, it, it's a lot of things that we, a lot of challenges that we have to meet here, but, you know, I don't know. I, that's a long-winded way of saying the prestige thing is real and not real the same time it's a true part of the whole thing but it's really you know it doesn't actually function the same for everyone involved we really need to think about that and that in some ways that's a straight up class issue you know um but also just um you know as an artist if i could ramble slightly longer you know i, I see it from another angle too i mean we put the artists and the, and the cultural workers are the ones creating the prestige in a way. We're creating the object that everyone is centered around. So, you know, we're not just working on it, we are it. 
Um, and I think that needs to be recognized. That's such a good point. I like that. Carissa, Brian? Yeah, I was surprised by how, what a like chokehold that idea of just like passion and pride and also the, that toxic, we're all a family notion has on people. I was surprised coming across people who were like, I want to do this, but I'm nervous about what my manager will think, or I don't want to feel like I'm, it's a betrayal. And it's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> like, it, it's kind of shocking how much like the love of what you do can kind of cloud your judgment in such a real, like tangible and practical way. Um, and I think kind of breaking through that and, and acknowledging it and like, you know, saying like, okay, that's wonderful. I'm glad you have such a wonderful relationship, you know, with the people who affect your lives, <laughs> your life so intensely, but, you know, you should also from a place of love, like if you want to go that route, push back and say, well, if this was, you know, something that is so important and I should feel this passion for, I should also be able to live and feed myself and my family. Um, and it's it's like a it's a tricky thing with organizing because you always want to have like kind of a gentle hand with certain with people who are really feel that way but you also kind of want to shake them <laughs> so that's that's something about organizing that i was like really was an eye opener to me because i'm i guess i'm kind of used to um being a like a person who has done customer service for so long and you know front facing it's when you're a person who is dealing with the public all the time you kind of get, uh, I don't want to say jaded, but you start to get kind of an eye for BS and you get like, you know, you start to see kind of through certain things like that, where you feel yourself being pushed and you feel your boundaries being pushed and you feel people like trying to, you know, push you into doing things that are not good for you and convincing you that it's for the, you know, for the greater good of all, but how can we all work toward this mission if we're not taking care of ourselves first um yeah well <laughs> you know the the passion thing is great and i definitely feel it. i've never had a better job i and i say this all the time and when i first was talking to people like i've never met a better group of people i've never enjoyed a job more like there's a reason that i've been doing what i do for so long and i you know kind of take the bad with with the good it's definitely true and it it definitely is something to acknowledge and honor but there has to be a point where we, you know, get past that a little bit and say, okay, you know, I do feel good and I feel great and this is wonderful, but I also, you know, got to eat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Brian, I don't know if you want to. So for me, I don't know personally that I, uh during that period of the unionization and whatnot, I don't think the, the feeling of family was quite there because of all the scandals that happened. It's just like, well, if we're a family, how could you let this guy do this and that person do this and that person do that and get away with it so long and hurt the family, you know, and everybody was feeling so hurt and, and, and experiencing pain. Um, so I don't know if during our efforts we had that. Uh, I mean, the museum couldn't, you know, management or whatever couldn't use that to to try to justify anything at the time or at that period, because there was no um, <laughs> there was no love being felt. Uh, so, um, you know that they're like they couldn't be a family with pizza pies. You know, they couldn't even have a pizza party and be like, hey, everybody's contributing, or everybody's having fun. Um, so, but I think there was a lot of camaraderie and friendship and, and personalized families within the organizing committee. We, we felt like a, the, the, org, the OGs, as we call them, we felt like a family. You know, we were getting together every week and, you know, the, and, and, and working, and working at, cohesively as a group um, and, you know, knowing that we were working for a better cause. That's what felt like a family, you know. Um, versus the feeling that we were getting working with the museum, which felt more, not, not oppressive, but 
I, I, some people have felt oppressive. I, you know, I work in a different department. I don't, I don't have some of the experience, uh, experiences that curators and, and assistant curators have. So, um, and you know, sometimes uh, it's just completely unaware of all that other dynamic going on. You know, um, like our we, our mission is to support the art, but in IT, our mission is to support the worker. I guess, and 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 you know, just you know, we're like facilities. You know, we, we make sure the lights turn on, the air conditioner works. You know, that 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 type that type of dynamic and role. Um, so, for me, it was a different feeling, I guess, um, versus the other more collaborative departments. So. I'd, I'd love to build on something Brian is talking about here, and say, you know. Um, the family tends to come up when they're asking for something from you. <laughs> and that's, it sounds in a way dysfunctional because, you know, people, people have knowledge of the experience of families that are dysfunctional. And that usually is a one way street kind of. So one way to be a family, and it really isn't because it's a giant museum. That's what this is, not a family, <laughs> we're not related. But we can have a respectful environment where people respect each other. You know, we can build that in. We can build that into the way that we work. And we can get people that are bought, bought into that. And that can make people feel more included, I'm quite sure. Um, but, you know, it also does this other thing, which when you talk about family, it, it personalizes everything. So then it becomes, oh, this person did it to me. That person did it to me. This is the bad leader. That's the bad leader. And actually that distracts us from what we're really doing, which is trying to create a better system. You know, a system of dialogue, a system of sharing power to some degree, but only for the purpose of making it better, a better institution. I'm not, I'm not here to get power for power's sake. I don't care about that. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think family is a great word and people in politics use it um, when they wanna cut past an issue and get to something that hits you right in the heart. But, you know, I don't know. I, I, I can't speak to how everyone uses that, those words, but I, I have the suspicion that, um, you know, really we need to just be talking about a, a working environment that respects the people that work there and, and compensates them appropriately based on our resources. Yeah, um, I think those are all really, really good points. So I wanted to ask more specifically, since we've sort of been talking about this with this subject, um, more about what the anti-union or union busting campaign was, some of the questions that have already come in, people are asking about sort of fear of retaliation, and maybe some of that um, we can deal with by sort of talking about what you're likely to face in, you know, what kind of pushback you've gotten from management, what kinds of retaliation you maybe have seen. Anybody, anybody? I can, Carissa, so, all right. Yeah, I, I feel like, okay, this was another thing that also surprised me about organizing is you kind of prepare yourself and you steal yourself for the reaction from management. And in a weird way, I think that the most effective anti-union strategy that I have witnessed in various forms is misinformation and like a, a strange kind of like false incompetence where it's like, oh yes, okay, we are supportive. Like, you know, we respect your right. And then they kind of bury you in a bunch of like weird information or non-information or confusion um, because nobody wants to especially after and this is i don't know if this is like if everyone has this like kind of reaction to um the new museums organizing it was really rough to look at and to witness and it made the new museum look really really bad so i think people are getting more sophisticated and they're getting more um you know, tricky with their anti-union campaigns. And instead of outright maybe, you know, hiring that thousand dollar an hour law firm, they're, you know, oh yes, it's just like for this type of purpose or, you know, it's just, you know, to keep 
things covered to make sure you're getting everything that you should be getting and you know but at the same time you're denying a bunch of people access to the union or access to information about the union or you're kind of putting out there these weird you know little sentences and tactics and these little all everyone emails that cause confusion and panic and people who are already kind of on shaky ground because they're not sure how the process works. So <laughs> I feel like in a way, like we've all had to get a little more um, vigilant about things like that. And we've all had to like talk to each other more and kind of like, you know, be a guide for each other to see through a lot of those tactics and to just be like aware of them. Cause they won't ever outright say like, we hate this, it'll be, you know, contact your collective bargaining agreement or, you know, consult your collective bargaining agreement. It's like, we don't have one. <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, so I, I feel like I was very surprised by how, um, I guess, non-union busting these campaigns have been, like non-apparent um, or like not super, you know, <clears throat> out there, the union busting tactics have been. And when you compare it to like other, I guess, crises or like, you know, situations that happen in museums just naturally because, you know, cultural institutions and arts institutions invite conversation that can be difficult. It's very interesting how the messaging kind of changes or can be molded to fit, um, you know, a different narrative that you know not to be true. I, we also, joke a lot like among <laughs> my colleagues that you know it feels like we're being gaslit all the time and it feels like you know there's it's like you know there's a handshake happening but a knife behind the back not to be dramatic but <laughs> that's sometimes like how it kind of feels um yeah so while I can't say like definitively like that was a tactic or like this feels like a tactic sometimes I it feels like I have to put on my little you know, tinfoil hat and read between the lines. <laughs> That's real. That's real. Robert? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, Chicago has Haymarket and Pullman and other kinds of old timey labor actions that were really rough, but it's nothing like that. You know, it's, it's the 21st century and there are expensive consultants that come up with really sophisticated words to sound like oh it's an info session or it's a meeting you know it's it's oh we're just trying to help you with some information you may not have received so you know it's like and it's pretty i think you could look at it as um in a bizarre way it's an advance from the past i guess it's not so violent or whatever it was it's you know it, it's it's 21st century communication skills and and they're kind of employing deploying them here and you know i i think I think maybe the biggest thing about it is just kind of the relentless drip of it. It just keeps on coming and another email and another email, and another email. And you look at them and you're like, each one of them is fairly, you know, transparently not quite adding up, at least from our perspective. Um, but, you know, you, you, you still you should realize that this is the environment that's been created around everyone. So this is what they're seeing. And, and like, like any sort of, if you've seen an election or any kind of politics function, repetition is sometimes one of your strongest cards to play. So that's what that's what I see. And for us, you know, it's like the the thing that we're talking about is so much not so much responding to all these things that they say. It's just saying no. If you respond to all the things they say, now you're saying what they're saying. So we have to just say our thing and just talk about what our goals are and talk about what our hopes are and what we're trying to do and our message. And that seems to work better. Um, and keeping our, our interpersonal relations. You know, we talked about the difference between chosen family and, and this other type of family that, that they're talking about. Um, you know, keep talking to the people that you know and, and keep the communication lines open. And that seems to be the best way to sort of keep our movement intact despite the relentless kind of information. Other, yeah. 
Well, uh, what what you what yeah, Chris and Robert have both said really uh, resonates and sounds um, much like the experience that we've had at Mass Mocha um, during the very uh, early phases of our organizing and after we went public. Um, the museum maintained a neutral position on our efforts, um, and that and yeah, as I as I mentioned, that's what their approach was, and we were grateful for that for not having. Um, the sort of interference that we had seen at other museums, like the new museum, as Chris mentioned. Um, but uh, as bargaining has started, we um, have noticed a change in uh, the tone of communications um, for management. Um, and uh, also, as Chris yeah, was saying, the sort of inf information um, being provided by management versus information that um, is coming from us and from the union. Um, we've, we felt as though the management information has been a bit misleading. Um, so it, we are now sort of more um, on the alert for more subtle um, anti-union um, activity. Yeah. Brian, anything to add? It's also okay. You all don't have to answer every single one of these if you don't want to speak to them, I should say, but if you want to. So it was interesting, you know, like our, our museum used their long term uh, agency that had used forever, who just happened to be anti union busting organization, anyways, law firm. Um, you know, the, it was just easy for them, it was, you know, it was just an easy slide, they didn't have to search for anybody. Um, so they, they, they already had the ball rolling, I guess, you know, if, if you think about it. Um, with their efforts and our communications that we were sending out versus the communications that they were sending out was much more informative um, and, you know, drove the ball home. Uh, there, you know, like museums and institutions, lack of transparency is their biggest weakness. And that, that's, and that's how we defeated their misinformation was that they weren't being transparent, but we were. And so people could see that for their own, I think, and, and, and you know, um, we're able to tell that information. And so that's why we kept on having such strong support. Um, you know, the, the communications team that we had for the union, you know, um, the, uh, all these teams, I guess, form naturally, you know, like with, during their OG sessions, we like, we need a communications team. We need this team, we need this team, we need this team. And people volunteered or were nominated for it. Uh, because of their current skills in the museum, you know, like uh, development assistants are great at sending out email blasts, you know, and so uh, using those skills and to to benefit the, the the union and the communications during that period. Um, and I want to touch upon the siloing and the public, you know, between the public facing people and, and the not public facing people uh, in, a, in a bit. Um, it, it is a very interesting and hard dynamic um, to try to break that siloing. Um, and, you know, I feel like our union here personally, uh, there's always a picnic like every two to three months. So, you know, not, not everybody comes, but it's just, you know, there's always something to try to break that silo to, to meet everyone if you can. Um, you know, and we have uh, listening sessions or, or, or like union, big, Big union meetings, uh, uh, member meetings, um, every month or so. So then we can then just also have face to face, say hello, and decimate the information you know that we get overall, and, and try to have people join the affinity groups and the committees. We're just like you know, there's always positions like we don't turn anybody away. If you want to be bargaining, come to bargaining. If you want to be this, if you want to be on the communication teams. It's open. You know, there's there's no. Um, there's no stopping you, you know, there's no requirements to joining these, these, uh, these separate committees in a sense. Um, and uh, <laughs> retaliation, it's hard to say what was retaliation during the pandemic, what they classified as economic layoffs or, or whatnot versus retaliation, seeing who, you know, took the brunt of it, who wasn't brought back, you know, um, and, that's just, it's it's a hard one, you know. Um, you never know how they're going to act. Uh, I felt a little bit more insulated from retaliation, so I was able to feel um, I could be more vocal uh, about things because you know it's just like, well, I'm too, 
I'm too much of a cog. If I disappear, they're going to, this is just going to be a mess. It's going to be hard to fill to, to, to try to replace that institutional knowledge. It's just going to take them forever to get through, you know, and I'm just like, and then during the pandemic, I was even more critical because I was IT, you know, and so it, it was just, you know, that if you can, if there are people in your team that you know that are just so hard to replace and, and um, they're less likely to be retaliated against and they could be your, your voices if they're willing to be, you know, so um, it, it just all depends, you know, some people, if it, I was ready to make the sacrifice, I guess, <laughs> you know, um, you know, and, and, and some people did and, and it, we still keep in touch. So, you know, um, some people ultimately just didn't come back because they found better opportunities afterwards. You know, they were asked back, but, or they might've been asked back, but, you know, it's like, oh, you know, <laughs> this place is paying me more than you could. So why am I going to come back or something like that, you know? So we lost a lot of good people that way too, which, which hurt and so you know it would have been nice to, to to for them to come along with the ride and see you know our finished product um, at the end you know what we're all fighting for thanks um we had a couple of questions that i just wanted to jump on real quick because we had a couple of people asking about management positions or being called management and this is just something rather than making everyone on the panel um speak to because this is everybody's favorite union busting tactic these days is breaking up the bargaining unit by declaring a bunch of people managers and according to the law and i am not a lawyer so i should probably ask becky to handle this one more specifically but um you are not a manager unless you actually have hiring and firing power. And these are things that will be fought out during the process of unionizing, bargaining, et cetera. Um, you can see this sort of play out in a lot of these drives. So just because the company says you're a manager doesn't mean you're actually a manager for legal purposes and that you may still be eligible to be part of the union. Um, don't trust, in other words, what your boss says about your eligibility for the union, because if you have a boss, you're probably eligible for the union. And I'll jump um, in. I'll jump in, Sarah, yeah. and just yeah, say yeah. Um, one of the things that's inspiring about this um, real upsurge in organizing in, in museums is that this is wall to wall. And so a lot of people have brought up in the chat and in the QA these silos. And whether we're talking about people who are designated as managers but wouldn't necessarily meet meet the legal definition or whether we're talking about people in different departments or whether we're talking about including everybody in from you know curators to cafeteria staff uh, maintenance and everybody else this is a really new and um inspiring approach to organizing um and you know there's lots of there's lots of sayings maybe some of them are cliches but like organize and the law will follow don't take someone's word for it that someone doesn't belong in your bargaining unit fight for them, organize together with them, and then fight for them to be in your bargaining unit. Yes, absolutely. Um, so jumping off of that and some of the things that you all have been saying, um, we wanted to talk specifically about um, organizing in a pandemic and maybe some tips that you can give because some of the questions again that we're getting are questions about distributing the work of organizing, um, breaking through the fear that people have. And especially, you know, because all of you have been doing this process in the middle of a pandemic, um, any sort of practical tips you have from your organizing process about any of those parts of it? Carissa, you look like you want to answer that. Yeah, I can talk about it. Um, I feel like the biggest and most important thing that was the most helpful in spreading the word and like getting people on board was just information and dispelling. A lot of people don't know about it. I did it. I, I thought that, you know, I thought a lot of things about humans <laughs> that I found to not be true. And a big thing is like, I, am I even eligible? Like, you know, stuff like that. So I think just talking, talking, talking and sharing information, like the biggest way that employers suppress things like unions is by not allowing us to talk openly and freely or to not feel comfortable talking openly and freely about things that we want to improve. Um, it, you'd be shocked how much people are going through that they just never talk about because it's rude to talk about or, you know, they don't, they're afraid to talk about it or they think that nothing will come 
of talking about it. Um, that and just like kind of, you know, really being proactive and really like being a, a listening ear and like, you know, really following up with people. Like people want to be talked to, especially now we've been like separated from each other for so long. And, you know, just being kind of a person who is open to hearing what people have to say is like kind of the biggest thing. So if you can get a few people who, you know, are good listeners and who <laughs> care and who have like good rapport and are, you know, just open to talking to people and hearing what they have to say, that is like your biggest and strongest asset. Um, just knowing what to ask and how to ask it and how to offer, you know, your support and offer like, you know, just an ear is kind of like the, the most, it's like the most important thing you can possibly do. Um, being social <laughs> really helps, you know, and you don't even really have to be. If you have like two people in your department that you talk to um, all the time, you are going to have these conversations. Hopefully they come up anyway dispelling kind of rumors and you know just being very proactive and really having like intense and sometimes difficult conversations is kind of the best thing that you can do I think um when organizing and just being a good listener now I want to second that listening part you know um when you're when you're there to talk uh with your employee especially if you're trying to organize listening to their grievances um you'll realize that a lot of them are the same even they feel siloed but the management doesn't listen or you know I, I don't get compensated enough it, it's it's almost like it's planned in a sense like they design these departments are to function that way um with more with less you know like every department you know it's like another saying um that gets thrown around a lot and it's even more true now that there's a lot of deficits in employees or, or bodies in the building people are doing a lot more with less staff you know with less man hours you know, putting in you know um like departments are short 106 man hours because there, there are people missing you know and that's a that's a lot of work for everyone to have to carry so um being very empathetic uh goes a long way um so th that's one way to help during organizing during the pandemic um zoom as useful as it is it stinks you know so uh have those socially distanced picnics outside in the park not indoors outside in the park so then there's like fresh air and people feel a little bit more comfortable um you know, even if they're not union, just like, hey, you know, just a bunch of friends hanging out, you know, and, and we, we don't talk shop, and, you know, we just talk about our day, you know, sometimes shop just happens to talk, you know, just happens to come up. <laughs> so, um, and, and, you know, so. I'll, I'll third the listening thing. I, I think that's the key difference that makes the difference. Um, over and over, people I've talked to, it's just, you know, I just shut up for a while. And that was kind of shocking in a way, I think, to some of them, it's like, oh, you actually heard what I said, or you, you get what I said. I try to repeat it back to them in a way. You know, yeah, I heard what you said. Um, but also, you know, I think we were in a way fortunate that a lot of this activity happened during warm weather because it was one of my favorite things was the happy hours. And quite honestly, just we had like, BIPOC happy hour, we had organizing committee happy hour. There's a lot of different opportunities to have a brew or, or a snack and just, it didn't have to be focused on this agenda necessarily. You know, half the time it's just being with people. So, and that's another thing that I guess just to use the abstract term management maybe can't do so easily. They can't have a picnic with everybody all the time. So it's, it's easier for us to get with our coworkers than it is for them to get with them. You know, when they do that, it's a giant auditorium full of all the people. They can't, they can't get that close. <laughs> not to say that individual, you know, this is not to say, I mean, this is a little bit off topic, but department by department, it's okay to like your manager or feel like they are 
actually, you know, managing things well or helping you out or advocates for your department and your work. That's not at all contradictory to what we're doing. So, you know, it, it, it's just sometimes they're suffering under the same problem in a different way because they have to manage under this situation that we're all talking about. So, you know, you can get with them. You can have a, a beer with your manager, it's possible. I mean, we do it sometimes. So, you know, but I think just taking advantage of that one-on-one -on -one and keeping your brothers and sisters close is, is, is one of the best ways to, to approach this, kind of again, echoing Brian. Um, and I'll also say that um, having the layoffs um, was a very natural uh, conversation starter with um, our coworkers at Mass Mocha. Um, yeah, it was, and every, yeah, everything that was going on, it was very easy to say, how are you, you know, how are you feeling about what, what's happening um, and how do you think this was handled? Um, and another um, element of uh, being remote um, during our election process was that um, we did have mail-in ballots and folks were able to take their ballots home and to fill them out and to send them in um, privately, which I think um, really could, could put some people at ease who might've been concerned about um, having the election held um, in person at the museum. So related to all of this fun and exciting and cheery stuff, I um, wanted to ask about the role that racial equity and particularly I know at the Philadelphia Museum, um, sexual harassment was part of one of these scandals that Brian mentioned. Um, so yeah, how did these questions of equity and justice play into your organizing campaigns? Well, yeah, right. I'll go ahead, Brian. Ours, I think it was at the forefront because I think, uh, you know, like we were all over the news, I guess, you know, and had all the town halls. And so um, the, you know, DIA work was happening organically within the union, I guess, in a sense. Um, like right before all the scandals broke, there were people who had started Slack channels uh, on racial equality, uh, you know, um, start the conversation and, and the communication, but then that sort of disappeared after the scandals broke because, you know, there was all this new drama we had to deal with. Um, and, and, you know, it was just like in our face, I, I guess. Um, and then, you know, uh, then, the pandemic hit and then everything during summer happened and you know um scandals and scandalous emails went out a little bit here and there or, or not emails that didn't that weren't sensitive enough i guess um to to what was going on with their racial injustice so there was a lot of uh, a lot of town halls about that um but it just helped you know uh push for the the, the it just helped reiterate why we needed the union you know it just just kind of, it was just like we need the union because it helps with this we need the union because it helps deal with these issues you can you, you can file you have a different path of grievance you know um that management is not handling that there's a different route that you can take um and so that that's i think that's what helped too during that was like look you know obviously management wasn't doing its job here you know we're hoping and we're we're working to get a different route so then we can handle these problems that affect us all in 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 a way you know we, that we have the power to handle these problems that it's just not left up to somebody else to dismiss the issue you know so yeah i i feel like um it, it's a little different story for us. We didn't have quite that crystallizing event that Brian is talking about. Um, it, it's just, you know, America, you know, what's happening, you know. And um, so, but to some extent, I want to acknowledge that there are people inside the Arts Institute who have tried in their independent way, not necessarily through the union, but to try to affect some type of change. There, there are some newer folks that were brought on by at the you know, behest of some people within the worker pool and 
um, who, you know, some people feel like they're a positive presence. And I, I can, I acknowledge that from my position, um, that is a positive thing. It's good that people are trying to bring this change to the museum. I would say to that though, that um, there's no reason any of that needs to stop or go away or be diminished. I mean, one of the things being discussed, and I don't know if this is like management saying it, but it's kind of one of those rumors that somehow, you know, that's gonna stop. Whatever work anyone's done to this point will stop. And I'm like, well, of course it won't. <laughs> that's not at all what we're saying. We're, we're you as well. We're part of this museum, different BIPOC folks and, and people in different communities have different opinions on this, but I feel like, like Brian is relating that it provides an alternate path. It provides another seat of power and voice to help ensure that any good work is preserved and extended and that, um, and that we can also do more. So I, I just, for me, it's like, I, I, here's part of listening, right? I listen to and I understand the fears of people who've done good work, who feel like it might be brushed aside by some other thing that came along. And I understand that fear, but at the same time, I'm like, what about tomorrow? What about the next director? What about someone, else? you know, as time goes on, are those things gonna be preserved? Who's fighting for that to stay? Whatever, whatever bricks you put up, who's fighting to take care of those bricks and change out the mortar and maintain it, you know? Um, maybe bricks aren't the best analogy, but you know, who, who's, who's working on that foundation to make sure that it stays intact? So that's where I think the opportunity is in the union situation. Not, it's not a detraction from that. I think um, something that has come up a lot in the past few years is this idea of equity and inclusion. And as a result of that, a lot of institutions are looking at breakdowns of the race, um, gender of their employees um, and the people that kind of keep the lights on. And it really says something when the um, departments that are hit hardest by things like layoffs um, also tend to be the ones that are the most racially diverse. Um, and I think unionizing and organizing and talking about these things honestly and openly can is like kind of the first steps to addressing that properly. I think there's a lot of like flowery language and there's a lot of um, you know hand wringing about trying to figure out who's working there, why, how, and not enough about well, how do we make it so that this is a job that a person feels like they can have and also can live on like those it just there's such a disconnect between all these like surveys and all these um you know listening sessions and we're here for you but you're not doing anything to materially like change anything or you know you're you're pushing these agendas and you're pushing these you know this idea and this like you want to have this image of being like a museum or an institution that is really open to all types of people and serving the community, but you're not really, you know, upholding that if you're not paying the people who, you know, <laughs> who are, you know, um, trying to keep the institution afloat in these very like strong material ways, the people who are um, greeting people, the people who are, you know, cleaning the, the facilities. Um, like if those, if their lives aren't improving in any real way, then all of your talk about equity and inclusion really amounts to nothing. Yeah, thank you for, for that. Um, yeah, at um, MassMoco, we were, um, or I guess as Robert was saying, um, there's you know the, the desire to uh, acknowledge and continue um, the, the good work that is being done and Masmoka in part to address um, racial inequity. Um, we have had a series of anti-racism trainings, which um, we would like to continue, and that um, as part of our contract, we would like to um, include uh, mandatory trainings so that this work um, is ongoing and that uh, changing leadership. Um, won't have um, an effect on 
uh, that work being uh, continued. Yeah, I think, oh my goodness, we have so many questions and we're coming close to time here. And I'm just like, this is, I feel like we're just getting into the meat of things and, and we all also have Zoom fatigue and, and want to wrap up. Um, so I guess I just want to give all of you a chance to, if there's any last thing you want to add before we wrap up here, um, if there's anything that I didn't ask or that we didn't get to that you'd like to speak to real quick. anyone other than the fact that we could probably keep going forever talking about all the fun specific details um, um i just want to say congrats to the guggenheim on their incredible victory 93 to 10 Woo! brian did you have something you wanted to i don't know so uh, when Carissa was talking about like them hosting listening sessions and stuff like that, it just reminded me of all the town halls and listening sessions or or organizations that they hired to listen to us so that they could just read a report at the end without actually listening to us, you know, um, and how much money that museums seem to waste on those groups and organizations versus them actually just sitting down and talking with their staff. Um, I know it's harder <laughs> for that to happen sometimes. Uh, they, they set up this wall or that they can't sit down. This is like, but we want to sit down. We just want to have a beer and have a conversation, you know, or, or coffee. Um, you know, yeah, it's hard to go and talk with, depending on your size of the institution, uh, you know, 300 employees. But, you know, like it needs to happen, you know, not just in this one hour town hall session. Um, so, yeah. All right. <laughs> so I think uh, we are going to wrap up here then. I'm going to hand this back to Becky, but thank you to everybody who's come along. We have been recording this. It will be available for you to share with your coworkers, your friends, your neighbors, your brother-in-law, if yours like mine happens to also be a museum worker. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for being here and thank you for having me. And uh, Becky, it is all yours to close out. I will unmute and say thank you so much. I really want to thank our panelists in this last couple of minutes. If any of you panelists um, or those of you in the audience want to put any links uh, in the chat to the work that you're doing, you're organizing. I know there's some wonderful Instagram. The visuals uh, are really phenomenal of the Museum Worker Union. So do share your links and, uh, and other people can uh, check out what each other is doing. But um, I just want to thank our panelists. You guys were phenomenal um and this is a really riveting discussion and yeah we could we could go a lot longer this has just been this has just been really great and uh sarah you were uh the moderator we we dreamed up so thank you uh sarah this is this has been fantastic um and i'm gonna hand back to todd who can um tell you a little bit more to uh think about that's coming up with our learn program and i will say that um as we think about learning organizing history there is a short non-credit uh, evening labor history class uh, starting in a few weeks that I recommend if you're starting to learn, as we said, many people don't necessarily know much about unions and I think knowing knowing the history is is a good thing to do if you can if you can cover out the time so. Um, I just want to thank everyone and i'll give uh, Todd the last word, thank you Todd. Thank you so much, Becky. And I think you hit all the high points there. Yeah, I, I put uh, links in the chat if you want to follow Learn on Facebook or Twitter. We offer all kinds of uh, free public programming and also really affordable classes. Becky mentioned the labor history class, which will meet on Wednesday evenings for three hours from November 3rd until early uh, December. And it's going to be workers from all different industries and workplaces all around the US. And we have three really great uh, Rutgers labor historians that are going to be leading the class. Um, and it's $90 for a six week class. So it's really, we're trying to create a space for working people to learn together, to organize, to build power. 
Um, we've li been living through a long period of neoliberalism and it's about time that we started to take things back and rebuild a society that works for working people, one that's sustainable and that can have a livable planet and climate for our children and, and jobs that we can all afford to live and feed ourselves and our families off of and work with dignity and respect. And I wanna thank all the panelists for all the work that you all do in your workplaces each and every day to, to build that because you know all, all change starts at the very local level, right? It starts by taking that first step and we make the road by walking it. So thank you all for um, putting your footprints down in the sand and uh, helping to build this road that collectively we're all gonna benefit from in the future. And thank you again, Sarah, for being such a wonderful moderator. We're totally blessed to have you here this evening. And to all the attendees, thank you for joining us and for your great questions as well. Sorry we couldn't get to them all, but um, to be continued. And that's all for tonight. So we'll see you all next time on uh, different bat time, different bat channel. <laughs> thank you all.